to the Change Log episode 0.3.9. I'm Adam Stachowiak. And I'm Wynn Nevelin. This is the Change Log. We cover what's fresh and new in the world of open source. If you found us on iTunes, we're also on the web at thechangelog.com. We're also on GitHub. Head to github.com slash explore. You'll find some trending repos, some feature repos from our blog, as well as the audio podcast for your listening pleasure. If you're on the Twitter, follow Change Log Show. Not the Change Log. He's pretty cool, too. Uh, and I'm Adam Stack. And I'm Penguin, P-E-N-G-W-Y-N-N. Fun episode this week, finally getting to air our conversation with Thomas Fuchs from Scripty2, Scriptaculous, Zepto, Vapor.js, all things JavaScript. Yeah, this uh, this Vapor.js framework is really, really awesome. Yeah, it's like the Uber JavaScript framework, and it's the lightest weight JavaScript framework that you'll ever find. It's been forked how many times now? I don't know, upwards of 300, I guess. And it's got support for everything? Everything. And we also have you back from the UK. I am back stateside after uh, seven days over in the UK, uh, taking my life in, into my own hands, riding with a, a buddy that was driving on the wrong side of the road the whole time. So uh, plenty of uh, flashbacks to you know uh, European vacation when he goes around the roundabout. I saw that video you posted on the roundabout, too. Yeah, that magic roundabout, you know, that's the five-way roundabout. You know, it, you know it's magic when the, the actual street sign says the magic roundabout. <laughs> I was pretty lost just watching the video. I didn't know where they were going. I have no idea how those guys do not have more traffic accidents than they do. Yeah, I was certainly amazed. Like, insurance rates should be so high over there for sure, and oh, they I probably know. aren't. I guess the only saving grace is the cars are so small that it's, you know, easier to dodge each other. That's probably it. That's probably why they get away with it. So I love the country. Um, not so much sold on some of the products they sell over there, like um, pourable yogurt. This is what, you know, I guess it's popular to pour on cereal and stuff. So not exactly sold on that one. And the uh, the internets are quite dodgy for the Wi-Fi. But other than that, on my first time in the U.K., I really, really liked it. And you got the U.K. badge in Foursquare. Or not Foursquare, because you're anti-Foursquare. You're a Gowalla fan, right? So you got that U.K. badge. <laughs> I'm such a geek. I you know, probably paid at the wazoo on the data plan to, ch- to do a Gowalla check-in at Stonehenge. It's a shame how hard I'm laughing inside to know that, too, because we've been on road trips. And we've had to stop places just so you can get a check-in going on. I know. It's just it's, it's who I am. That's who you are. Well, we love you anyways, and it's, it's, we're happy, extremely happy to have you back, so glad you made it back safe, and I'm glad you had fun. Had a ball. Fun episode this week. Should we get to it? Let's do it, man. Hi, we're joined today by Thomas Fuchs from Scriptaculous fame. Thomas, for the folks that don't know, why don't you introduce yourself and let them know who you are. Hello, uh, I'm Thomas, Thomas Fuchs, Rhymes with Books. Um, I am the author of uh, the Scriptaculous JavaScript framework, which originated in like the Ruby on Rails uh, sphere uh, about five years ago, uh, together with Prototype.js. And uh, at that time, I also was a core team member of Ruby on Rails. And uh, I'm, I'm no longer a core team member, but I'm still doing a lot of JavaScript and uh, I I'm, guess I'm, I'm here in the show today to talk about that. Yeah, we want to talk about Scripty2. So give us the lowdown on the next evolution of Scriptaculous. Yeah, so uh, Scripty2 is it's, it's, uh, the <laughs> most important thing about it. It's very slow in the making, but uh, we, we'd, we'd like to take our time and, and only implement stuff that we actually use on like, real-world projects. We, we don't want to like, implement like, really big widgety frameworks that no one actually uses for code. So sometimes it's, it's, it's coming along very slowly. But anyway, it's a, it's a complete rewrite of Scriptaculous. And if, if you use Scriptaculous, you know that the central part of this is the effects framework. And that's been completely rewritten to take advantage of things like prototypes, um, custom events, and, and stuff like that. And uh, it's, it's written for extensibility and easy to read code. It's it's a bit more verbose than, than other code I write uh, and other projects I have. But it's it's there for you to take and, and extend and, and mess around with. And and it also has like really, really good documentation because this was something that was bugging me from the first version of Scriptaculous where we had like a wiki and then the wiki got shut down, and then the wiki, we put it on someone else's service, and then the service was abandoned, and, you know, it, it was quite crazy. 
But uh, yeah, the, the main focus of Script2 is uh, a completely new effects framework with a modern one using modern JavaScript techniques, um, very extensible. Uh, it's also usable for things that are not DOM nodes only, so not only CSS-based animation, but you can use it for example, you can tie it into Raphael.js and, and use it for SVG-based animations, or you, you can do animations on Canvas with it if you extend it in the proper way. But the basis of it is, is just a timing and a, a, a queuing framework for uh, visual effects. So still built on top of Prototype.js, right? Yes, it it's still uh, works on top of Prototype.js. So a question from Twitter, Johnson Page asks, um, what's the future of Prototype, in your opinion? Uh, with Prototype, we have some of the same issues where it's it's going quite slowly. However, it works very well. I use it in all of my projects, basically. It, it still works fine. Uh, we actually just released a uh, release candidate free of Prototype 1.7, uh, or 1.7.1. And... Uh, that brings us uh, IE9 compatibility because IE9 now uh, comes with like a finally uh, a DOM compatible events framework. That's the most important part about it for prototype chess. So it's it's going along. Uh, we are planning, still planning to uh, release a prototype 2.0 at some point. Of course, no roadmap or no time on that or date. But. Uh, the main thing about Prototype 2.0 will be that we're moving away from a prototype extension for anything that's DOM-related because that has proven to be a bit brittle in the past and, and very hard to maintain. It works, but it comes with a lot of disadvantages. So we're moving to something where we do not uh, will not no longer extend DOM nodes. But Prototype 2.0, for that reason, will break some compatibility with Prototype 1.0. But um, I think, actually, for Prototype, the most important part in Prototype is not so much the DOM stuff, but uh, the language stuff. This is where Prototype really shines. With If you have to do any sort of like data munging or manipulate uh, JavaScript stuff, you want the real class system, then Prototype is a really good choice. It, it really allows you to write really, really solid JavaScript and... Uh, Especially if you come from Ruby, because then you feel right at home in Prototype JS. You know, I was singing the praises of Underscore JS the other day. It's the uh, framework that adds a lot of those features, uh, kind of based on a jQuery model. And, and some guys kind of snickered and said, "You know, we've had that in Prototype for years." Yes, uh, uh, if you go to the Underscore website, it actually says it's an extraction from Prototype JS. So uh, it's yeah, it's it's pretty great. If you if you're using something else like jQuery or whatever other framework, and you want something for like data manipulation and especially doing stuff with, with, with data in arrays and you know you get some JSON data in, but you need to reformat it for something else, then underscore JS is a really good choice. Or, of course, if you're using prototype JS, you get all this sweetness like built in right into your framework. So we've got a pretty young audience, and it's kind of hard to believe it. We have a whole crop of web developers these days that have known nothing different than Prototype and, and jQuery. Talk a bit about the world before JavaScript frameworks and what it was like building JavaScript in the browser with uh, IE and, and uh, Netscape. Yeah, the, the so-called dark ages. Um, <laughs> right. So before, before Prototype was really the first uh, like JavaScript framework that actually bundled a lot of functionality that before that you would find like very like very diverse spots on the internet you know you of course there were just those sites where you could download uh, um, stupid things like mouse trail scripts and stuff like that or the, the scripts that would run some sort of marquee in your status bar and that sort of thing but uh like Good quality JavaScript was really hard to find because it, 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 lots of people just thought it is this toy language and it's not really widely supported anyway, which was probably true at that point. So my my first real um, adventures with JavaScript uh, began when uh, Internet Explorer 4 came out. And that was the first browser actually that was where like the JavaScript uh, and the, like 
Dom. I, I wouldn't call it Dom. It wasn't really Dom. It was like IE's version of Dom. But that was actually really usable to to make like highly interactive uh, apps and, and sites. And and at that point, uh, it was certainly the most advanced web browser available. Uh, of course, it was very limited from what we have today, and it was IE only and so on. So it wasn't really usable on on the web because most people used uh, Netscape uh, at that point. But uh, for applications that, that were like used internally or something, that it was a great choice to use that. It was actually um, in some ways um, much more rapid to develop stuff with, with Internet Explorer than to use any like sort of desktop-based uh, native applications for, for lots of types of applications. So this is, I think, where it all started. And, and uh, JavaScript at that point wasn't really much different from the JavaScript we use today. The JavaScript 1.5 has been uh, out for ages. Uh, and one, JavaScript 1.3 before that, and there's not so much difference between those languages. So um, you could have done a, a framework like jQuery or Prototype at that point in time, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. Have these frameworks uh, dumbed down the average JavaScript developer? Uh, that is a really good question. I don't think that they dumped down the existing JavaScript developers, but they certainly uh, they allowed in people that aren't really developers. Uh, so it's 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 a it's a twofold thing, you know. It's good that the language gets more developers, but at the other hand, uh, some of the frameworks, uh, I, I think especially jQuery, have such a low. Uh, uh, you know, low level of... of how, barrier how to entry? Yeah, barrier to entry, right? That that you get people that are not programmers or not developers, and they think they can develop. And, and uh, uh, you have to be very careful in that regard. You have to teach those people that they're actually dealing with a real language there, and, and there's really a, a, a complete language there. It's not only jQuery. It's, uh, you get a complete object-oriented, really, really uh, nice uh, scripting language there. And, and I think m one thing today uh, that, that is a problem is that uh, no one really reaches those people and teaches them how to actually program. And that leads to a lot of bad codes in the end, I think. You know, one of the things that uh, I found rewarding is stepping out of the JavaScript frameworks and out of the least common denominator, you know, kind of uh, facade we put across the browser differences. And, and if you target a certain mobile browser like WebKit or something on the iPhone, it really frees you to use the latest features of, of JavaScript. Yes, in, indeed. That's, it's pretty awesome. But I, I would even step back from that. And, and I would recommend, like, just sometimes for some projects, just you use pure JavaScript. If you have a little side project or something, try that. It's, it's actually not that hard to write JavaScript code that even works cross-browser in desktop browsers. Um, but as I say, WebKit is, is actually... Uh, I wouldn't even say WebKit on the iPhone is very special uh, as a special browser. It's, I would say WebKit is on most mobile browsers, actually, except for anything that, that's named Windows. So uh, if you can target a framework for mobile WebKit browsers that will allow you to very, very easily replicate any like bigger framework on the desktop, any bigger framework's API, with very, very few lines of code. And uh, I, I just released something called Septo. I mean, released. It's it's still in like its alpha stages, baby stages, but you can still write. Uh, you can write uh, like jQuery-like code that just works on mobile WebKit browsers and desktop WebKit browsers, and the whole framework has like is like 2K compressed, which is like a tenfold improvement on size over jQuery proper. It's been well received. So I guess the fundamental difference here is Zipto is kind of meant to be inlined instead of externally referenced. Yes, that's that's one of the ideas. Uh, I'm I'm not quite sure if it's actually feasible because I think it will end up with a little bit more than 2K uh, of code, more like 3 to 4K, which is like two screenfuls maybe. So, uh, but but you can take the core of Septo and just inline it if you have like a one pager application because that will make the loading of of your uh, application really fast. Like say. 
you have like an an application that kind of mimics a native application doing some task, specifically some task, and it also works offline and um, it uses local storage of some sort, then Septo is probably a really good choice because um, the user can practically instantly load it because it's so small from the code size. And then you go ahead and like load in your data and whatever, store it locally. And from that on, um, people will be able to use it. So the main idea behind it uh, was uh, like it was born when uh, we did a site called everytimezone.com uh, as like an ad for our uh, uh, time tracking software, Freckle. We use that quite extensively in the changelog to uh, schedule interviews. Awesome. That's great. It's good to hear. Uh, so that site is a single uh, HTML file. It, it uses, I think, one image, which is, which is the ad. It doesn't use any other images or external CSS files or external JavaScript files. So if you go to every time someone comes in a desktop browser and look at the source, everything that's on the site is right there in the source. The CSS is inlined. The JavaScript is inlined. It, it uses some sort of like early ancestor of the idea for Septo, like my ultra, ultra mini Pico tiny framework, which was basically five lines of code, like a dollar function, a function to set the inner HTML, a function to set CSS. That's, that's basically it. And um, it was born there because I could see, okay, you can make a complete application with really like only like a few support functions. And if you spin the idea further, if you use all the new and modern API calls and uh, uh, JavaScript uh, uh, API calls and DOM API calls in uh, the mobile WebKit browsers, then you could re really massively save on lines of code while still providing a very, very useful API. And in Septo's case, it's basically the complete uh, core jQuery API that it provides. You have a blog post on when you uh, ported this to the iPad and, and some of the considerations for that I found fascinating. So talk a bit about uh, considerations for images and, and CSS3 and, and Canvas for a moment. Yeah. So it's, it's CSS3 is pretty interesting because it allows you to use other things than image files for backgrounds. Uh, you can use gradients, CSS gradients. Uh, you could even use Canvas elements. Uh, as image backgrounds that you then can script from JavaScript. Uh, and the thing is, on mobile devices, uh, specifically the uh, iOS devices, uh, the web browser is, is basically, it, it, it doesn't have much to do with like a traditional web browser as you think of it. It's, it's more like a, a high-performance 3D game engine. Uh, the elements on your page are actually textures in 3D space. And... Uh, in my blog post, uh, uh, I, I don't like. I didn't explain it that way in the blog post, but it basically works out like this: the more images you have on your page, the slower it will get because the more textures will be involved. However, if you're if you have like a, a sane amount of images and textures, you can have very very fast uh, screen updates, rendering updates, because everything is is, is rendered by the hardware, uh, and that comes into play when you. Uh, uh, developed for mobile devices. If you have static images that are either image files or uh, uh, made with canvas or with uh, gradients, and if you just move them around with WebKit transform, for example, then you will probably no not experience any problems with rendering speed. However, if you move stuff around at the same time, change the DOM contents, for example, the inner HTML, the inner text of a, of a DOM node, then WebKit has to re-render the element for, for each frame and create a new texture and load that into the graphics memory chip and the graphics memory chip has to, and so on and so forth. So if you just move textures around fast, if you change anything about the elements, slow. Um, we had a particular problem on every time zone. There's a slider which allows you to select uh, the current time and then the page updates based on that. The slider shows the current time. So for each movement of the slider, we have to update the contents of the DOM node in there, which causes a bit of slowness. So because we couldn't change this particular aspect of the website because we wanted to have the time there, uh, we decided to look into what else can we optimize on the website. 
And it turns out that the biggest way or the easiest way to make anything faster on the web, and this is even true for desktop web browsers, is to uh, have as few nodes as possible on your page. We used um, CSS gradients and diffs, absolutely positioned diffs for the bars you can see on the background of the page, with which each, each bar representing a day in some time zone. And I think there are 36 bars on the page. So 12 time zones and three bars each. And uh, for each bar, each of those bars, each of those 36 bars is basically a texture for the browser that the browser has to update and render and stuff. We replaced that with one big canvas element that we just now update. And that turns out to be much faster because the, the whole graphics uh, chip just has to deal with this one big texture in the background instead of 36 individual textures. And that brought a big speed boost into our application. Um, there's some other um, CSS properties that uh, can cause performance issues because of the way the browser re-renders uh, elements and has to re-render textures, which is, uh, uh, for example, a box shadow causes performance problems. Uh, and there's other uh, properties, but you can read about that in my blog post. You know, I'm convinced if you want to drive traffic to your site, you just mentioned HTML5 and Canvas in the, in the headline. We posted an article this week <laughs> about a little framework called, or a little library called Jury that just provides a chainable wrapper to the Canvas object. And it's been highly popular. So are we at a point yet where adoption's to a point where we can get excited about Canvas? Uh, I think so. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that the, the, the blog post I wrote about iPad performance, I think it has had like 100,000 page views now. So... It's definitely there's a lot of interest in, in these technologies, and uh, if you want to have really well performing applications, uh, mobile devices are slower than desktop browsers. They have limited resources, so you have to understand more about how they work to make really uh, well performing web pages. If you just have a, a normal web page with some text and images on it, that doesn't matter. But if you have an application, it can. Uh, start to matter very quickly uh, if the user has like a really smooth and nice experience or everything is kind of slow and and, 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 and jerky and lagging. So uh, if you want to have the best experience for your user, you have to understand how these devices work and how these mobile browsers work and uh, how you can use all these new technologies like Canvas Elements and, and CSS free uh, uh, goodies and uh, also new DOM and JavaScript features uh, if you understand all of this, you can make web applications for mobile devices that uh, just work so much better. You know, our industry tends to find uh, buzzwords to rally behind. I remember it was uh, DHTML back in the day, and then it kind of morphed into uh, AJAX, and now the latest buzzword is HTML5. What does HTML5 mean to you? Um, HTML5 for me, I, I do know that it's it's... Technically, only means like an upcoming standard of HTML, but HTML5 for me is a technology of families, which includes the HTML5 specification for the next next uh, generation of, of the HTML uh, uh, markup language. But it also includes for me all the improvements to JavaScript that are done, all the improvements to the DOM that are done, and uh, also all the CSS3 improvements and uh, other technologies that are extending the DOM, like uh, local storage and, and uh, geolocation and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's a good word for uh, defining the family of these technologies that are coming up now, you know, Canvas also. You know, I probably am not understating this. I think a, a little framework's come along to, to really change the landscape, and it, it um, really is redefining everything we thought we knew about JavaScript, and that's Vapor.js. Oh yes, yeah. Vapor.js is is pretty amazing. Uh, it's the only JavaScript framework in existence that is compatible with any browser that has ever been made and will ever be made. Even browsers that don't support JavaScript run Vapor.js fine, which is a, a pretty amazing achievement if you think about it. Uh, we also have uh, <laughs> indefinite test coverage, which is pretty awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. It's, I think no other software project in, in, in history has, has had that. So that's a, quite an achievement, especially if you think that Vapor.js was released after having like four, 
four or five beers on like the weekend of JS Confu. I just noticed you uh, pulled in a a uh, patch from Kenneth Reitz here on the uh, the change log, so added X ex- core support. The really amazing thing about Vapor.js that it is that it came together in in just like two or three hours after having lots of beer at uh, JS Confu uh, last month. So that was it's pretty great. All these achievements in in, in that short a time. Uh, we also hold it like 140 forks on GitHub right now, I think. So it's been pretty popular. JSConf EU, give us a recap. Oh, JSConf EU is awesome. Uh, f- first of all, uh, uh, the organizers of the conference are just amazing people. It's it's like w- what they pull together uh, in like a completely non-profit way is amazing. So it's it's uh, really props to them for 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 putting the show together. It was really great, great location. Uh, lots of of great people, very enthusiastic about JavaScript. You could really feel that uh, there's something going on in in the community with with JavaScript. Everyone is really excited, and there was a really good mixture between uh, server side JavaScript and client side JavaScript stuff, which which, which I found uh, find great because there's a lot of stuff people can learn from each other. Uh, as I said earlier, that. Lots of people are drawn into JavaScript by, by libraries, and they don't really know what they're doing. Maybe they're like designers and just want to extend some websites a little bit. But the server-side JavaScript stuff actually draws in a lot of really, really good programmers to JavaScript. And this will help the language a lot. And you could see that at JSConf EU, I thought there was a, a lot, a lot of great uh, talks there and content. My favorite talk was about uh, Fab.js, which was just a mind-blowing talk. I hope the video of that is up soon. It's, everyone should see that. It's, it's like a really, really good example of how you can take an existing language and completely rethink the way it can be used. I'm not saying I, I would like use it next week or, or in, in, at any point, but uh, it's a really, really well example of take something and just try to take take a step back and rethink something that was really really great and awesome and and of course i just released was uh, chris williams talk on promote js which was one of the greatest uh, talks i've ever seen in my life i think on on, on a programming topic it's so much really love went into this you know it's uh, chris is 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 so enthusiastic and and uh, uh, excited about javascript as a language and i think we all should be that there's a lot of uh, bashing going around. I do that a lot of the time. I really like to bash sometimes <laughs> at things uh, like IE9. Uh, I, I don't get Microsoft at all, I think. But uh, there's also so much energy there. And if you take that and channel that into something good, instead of of, of, of always lamenting and, 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 and crying about that JavaScript documentation is so bad, instead like sitting down, writing JavaScript documentation or linking to good documentation so people can find the stuff and people get, exciting, uh, get excited about JavaScript as much as we are excited about JavaScript in the JavaScript community. Uh, everyone wins. Absolutely. Now we're on board with that effort. So in the change log, that's the uh, Promote JS banner in the, in the sidebar, if you've seen that and wondered what that was. Great. So server-side JavaScript, does this have you excited at all, or are you still slinging Ruby on the server-side? Uh, I'm slinging Ruby on the server-side. Uh, I do like JavaScript a lot, but I also do like Ruby a lot. And, uh, of course, we have existing projects. There's no need for us to like change it over to JavaScript now because it's it's cool. Um, but it, it definitely is, is a good... Um, thing that happens there because javascript now as a language gets things like uh, a common library and stuff on the server side so that that's really good it's actually been around for a long time uh server side javascript but it it, it never really picked up until uh, node.js came along and uh i i was there when um ryan uh ryan Dahl did his first node.js talk and and uh it was amazing so um, mind blowing again. It's like someone sitting down and rethinking the way something works completely. It's it's just always amazing to watch that process, even if you do not have an, uh, an immediate use for it. Uh, we might actually go ahead and 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 use Node.js for an upcoming project uh, where we have to deal with a lot of real time stuff like WebSocket and that, that sort of thing. And for 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 these things, it's it's really shines uh, for 
things where you would now use Ruby on Rails, for example, I think it might be a bit premature to just uh, drop everything you have and, and, and uh, just uh, adopt Node.js. But for new projects, sure. I noticed you forked a project that we covered last week in the chain log, uh, Eyeballs.js. Yes, I, Eyeballs is great. Uh, it's, it's from my friend Paul Campbell. And uh, it's, it's, it's basically a clone of Ruby and Rails, but running in the browser uh, using things like uh, WebSQL as, as backend. So that's pretty good, uh, a, a pretty great thing to have if you have a more like data-centric backend and like send along like JSON messages and stuff. And you want to render more in like a templated way on the, on the front end. That's something uh, we have a use for in a current project, so that's why I forked it. I haven't committed back any patches yet, but uh, uh, I might soon. So what's your hopefully. take on templating choices? Templating is interesting. It's, you know, if a developer is bored, uh, the developer will develop either of two things. One is a testing framework, <laughs> or a second thing is, is a templating language. There's so many out there. It's like if you if you Google for JavaScript testing frameworks, I, I don't know. I think there's like hundreds of them. Yeah. And for templating, templating language, it's similar, and um, it's quite useful for a lot of things, but it won't solve all your problems. You should never forget that you have a full-blown language at your disposal at all times if you do JavaScript. So you shouldn't try to to like get too meta. You know what I mean? That that you try to put everything into the templating language and then you kind of have a language in the language, not good. So it, it should be very basic if you use a templating language, in my opinion. You know, one of the approaches is to start putting uh, your templates in script tags with just an alternate language declaration. Uh, do you follow this approach at all? Uh, I don't. I'm aware of it. And there's also things like CoffeeScript, for example, that, that kind of is a new implementation of JavaScript in script tags and that gets re-evaluated. Um, and personally, I like JavaScript too much that I'm a big fan of those other approaches, but I can see that some people would prefer that, yes. So templating, I, I guess a lot of the projects that you write, you write with uh, with Amy. So who handles yes. the templates? Uh, so the way we work is, uh, it's, it's basically, I, I'm, I'm the dumb programmer. But um, I'm pretty good with coming up with, with like strategies to achieve the impossible, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, but what, what Amy does is she has the ideas for the project, and she does uh, visual design and, 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 and user uh, interface design and user experience design uh, and concepts, she says, <laughs> from the other room. So I, I'm, I'm really like the, 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 the dumb person in this team. So talk to us about Freckle and, and some of the uh, partnerships you guys have done. Yeah, so Freckle, that, that was our first big application together. And uh, uh, Freckle is a time tracking software. And the thing, the reason we wrote it is at that time, we did a lot of consulting. And there just was no good way to track your time with any web application or any desktop application for that matter. They were all just too complicated and, you know, like a series of drop-down lists. And when you got a new client, you had to configure like half an hour, everything that you could actually start logging time. Uh, with Freckle, we, we wanted none of that. We wanted that you can launch the application and instantly log time because that's what the application is about. Everything else, the configuration of stuff and things that can come later when you have time when you sit down and, and, and look at the hours you know then you can go ahead and and like type in a budget and, and that sort of thing so it, it was really about the most efficient way for the user to enter time nothing should get into the user's way and this is where web applications can be really great uh, the browser is is really a, a, a blank canvas it's you can do basically everything in the browser you are not um, subject to limitations that you have in native applications where like widgets are not configurable and stuff because you can just change everything around everywhere. And that's, the, that's the power of web applications, I think. You can really adapt and, and with JavaScript you can do anything you can think about in, in a web application. The problem that many web applications have is that people try to stay in some sort of like standard compatible mode or uh, do not want to be too, you know, bold in doing applications. But I, I think that approach is not good. That approach only 
uh, leads to like boring applications that look like every other application that will if you if you sit down like this and you know if you look at every other time tracking application if we had would have done that at the point when we made freckle we would just have produced another applications with drop downs and you have to configure it before you enter time that that's not the way great applications are made great applications are, are made by looking at what the user really needs and wants and then you start everything from there not looking at the other stuff maybe at some point in the development cycle later, you start looking at the other stuff and see what they do and, and what you do and compare a little bit. Um, but when you start something, don't try to look at other stuff. Just try to do your thing. I think that's important. And that's the important thing we do. We, we do not really listen to, to many other people. Otherwise, we, if, I, if I, would, I would have listened to all the people in my life that would tell me what to do. I would probably be still at university and then I would be employed somewhere until I'm 80. <laughs> uh, you know, just try to do your thing. I think that's the most important lesson that you can have in life. So Amy's a big proponent of info products. I know you have some out there under your own name. Um, you've written both printed publications and, and uh, I guess, eBooks and what we would call info products. What's your, your take on uh, doing this as a developer? Yeah, info, info products has a really bit uh, like bad ring to it, you know. It, it, it sort of has like this like sleazy aura. <laughs> but in, info products are really great. It, it's just it's, there should be a better name for that. It's it's like you know webinar is one of those words, or um, it's just not good. It's not a good word. But but you know a lot of developers and a lot of people we know actually make good money by selling like PDFs or, or online courses or, and stuff like that. And uh, it really helps people because if you, if as, as a developer, for example, you're looking for some information about, I don't know, I was looking f for information about uh, the Vim editor, for example, this week. And so I got to, to Job's site, uh, peepcode.com, and, and, and he has a screencast on it. So, so I bought the screencast. It, it's the best way to learn it. And if you pay money for something, you are more inclined to actually pay attention because you're kind of... It's it's your hard-earned money that you invest into like getting more knowledgeable about something. And um, when people come to my uh, info product, for example, we have a, an info product called uh, JavaScript Performance Rocks. It's an ebook and a little helper bookmarklet application. Uh, people go there because they they want to learn about uh, web performance uh, specifically, and they pay some money and then they get really, really good information that we uh, took a long time to research. So it's, it's a very fair exchange. And uh, I think the web really allows you to self-publish these things without going through like a big publisher because the big publishers, uh, uh, what they do is they fuck you over. Sorry for my expletive. <laughs> no, that's right. You know, I came to... Um the Ruby and the Rails world, and I think Amy's cheat sheets were instrumental in, in helping me grok some of the uh, the things, the terms and the concepts uh, coming into that framework. And, and you know, I've, I've shelled out for uh, a couple of your JavaScript uh, eBooks. They're they're fantastic. I think it's a, a good value exchange on both sides. Yes, definitely. Anything else in the stables from uh, Thomas and Amy? Um, so yeah, we are working on a new product for customer support because all customer support uh, software sucks, basically. Uh, we, we, we tried everything, believe me. Um, and it's all really bad. Uh, and mo most of those products, the, the, the most important problem they have is that they, they do not build a bridge between what the customers tell you and then what you actually implement in your software. So we, we, we are trying to build something really, really great for that. Uh, it's called uh, Charm Desk, and you can go to charmde.sk to sign up for our like email when we will announce it. It says fall 2010. It probably will get winter 2010 before we will announce it. But uh, yeah, and we also have other products in the queue. So some of my closing questions were going to be um, Emacs or Vim or TextMate. It looks like you're a Vim guy. Um, I'm actually a TextMate guy. I just started using Vim uh, this week because uh, a developer we're working together very closely 
uh, is using it, and and he's all all about it. You know, he's really excited about it. And if someone's excited about it, I, I get interested because I like seeing people that are excited about something. And um, so I, I decided to to check out uh, Wim, and uh, I, I like it so far. Uh, I, I grok the basics already. Uh, it can only well, get better from there. Oh, it, of course, it, it it has a really steep learning curve, and it's 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 certainly not for everyone. But uh, it it does some things very well that that I was looking for in an editor. And with TextMate two being released, uh, I don't know when, whenever. Uh, yeah, I don't know whenever Duke Nukem four is released, you know. I'm on the same Vim journey, and I think uh, we're probably watching the same peep code from uh, uh, Jeffrey with uh, smashing into Vim with the soothing voice of Dan Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good, good one. It looks like I'm not the only guy that's uh, looking for the perfect terminal font, too. So I noticed on your blog, you're, um, I recently got turned on to Menlo from David Kaneda from the Cincha Touch team, and uh, you found a, a variant of Menlo that you're really liking. Yes, so... Uh, Menlo is a great font. It's it's based on a Bitstream Vera Sans Mono, I think, which is an open source font. And Apple adopted that font uh, as a new terminal font for um, Snow Leopard. And it's called Menlo. And some other people picked Menlo up and they they had little gripes about it, you know, like the shape of the zero, for example. In in Menlo, the, the zero is slashed. And a lot of people prefer dotted zeros. So people started to adopt the fonts. It's really interesting to see like this sort of like open source movement catching up into the space of, of typography and fonts. That's quite interesting, I think. And uh, those people then put the fonts on GitHub or, or somewhere. And uh, one of the fonts was called Mensch, which was a variation with the dotted zero, but it also did some other changes that I didn't like, like it had bigger angle brackets, uh, which kind of looked weird. But anyway, some other guy... Uh, fixed another problem I have with Menlo, uh, which is that the line hates, it, it's pretty like dense if you use it in the terminal or in, 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 in Vim, for example. So what he did is he, he made a little improvement or a little variance of the font with, with bigger line hates, with like a small line height, medium and large, with like, uh, more space between the lines. So I asked that guy to, hmm, this looks awesome. I really like the, your medium variation there. But I would also like to have the dotted zero from the other font. And, and, and so he just put it in, and, and that's what I'm using now. And that's what, what my blog post is about. So it's awesome. Bash or Z shell? Uh, for me, it's Bash. But uh, I haven't had the time yet to do uh, Z shell yet. So maybe I will switch at some point. This is the part where I now get to ask my guests what, uh, what's got you excited about the world of open source and turn me on to new, new projects to go and explore. What got me turned on about the world of open source? I think at the time I was really getting into open source. I didn't even realize it. Uh, I got into open source because I was researching what else is out there except for like Java or PHP to make a web application. Because at that time we were planning a web application that was in like 2004. And uh, so... I just researched on the internet and I stumbled upon this, this Ruby and this Rails thing and uh, that got me kind of interested in it and uh, I checked out uh, the IRC channel for it, asked some questions and like three months later I was on the core team of Ruby on Rails. So that was pretty quick. So I, I didn't even know what happened there exactly. But uh, since then I'm a big fan of open source and uh, it's not good for everything. For example, I wouldn't recommend designing anything open source, like visual design or something. That just doesn't work well. But for code, it's really, really great, especially if you can find projects where you have a benevolent dictator that really knows what he or she is doing. And uh, if you have programmers that just connect to you on the same level. Um, I can remember having uh, chats in like the Ruby and Rails core team channel uh, very, very could talk about stuff that we wanted to implement in the framework, and we were all we all so agreed on what direction should be. Uh, it, it was actually a bit scary to find like people from all over the world to like have exactly those same thoughts, but uh, that that what's happened there. So uh, if I can only recommend if you want to 
uh, as a listener, if you want to go into the world of open source and, and explore more and find a project that you can actually contribute to, find something that you're really, really excited about, uh, that you really, really want to make better. Do not try to get into a project just because it doesn't work. If you want to go into a project and, and really make it better, find something that you're actually really excited about. And there's so many projects out there, I'm sure there's something for you. What's got you excited that you just want to play with when you, uh, when you have some downtime? Um, uh, actually, like all sorts of gadgets and, and, and stuff. Like uh, I just ordered a, a drone, an R, uh, a, AR drone, which I have been flying around the office. It's kind of dangerous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that gets me excited. I, I also recently completed my project of building the Lego Millennium Falcon, the big one, with, with the help of some friends. That, that was quite awesome also. So uh, I, I like building things, uh, and I like creating things, even when it's not programming. One last question. I wanted to uh, get an update on Schnitzelkopf. Schnitzelkopf, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we did a, uh, Amy and me, we did a conference in September on bootstrapping businesses, especially web-based businesses uh, in Vienna. Because uh, the, the reasoning to do this is because there's so many people out there that think they need venture capital uh, to do software or companies or projects. That's entirely not true. We built everything we did without any venture capital or, or third-party money. It's all our money in there. And we we weren't rich before we started this. So we just did some consulting on the side and, and invested the money that we earned there into our own product, products, and that works fine. And now we can live of our own products, which is awesome. And uh, I can tell you that we can live pretty well uh, of our own products. So we wanted to spread this knowledge because there's so many people and developers and designers and entrepreneurs out there that that always think they need to you know, live up to like some some idea of how it should be that someone else told them. Like, you have to go to university and finish with a diploma or you have to finish high school even. You have to do this, you have to do that. You have to take venture capital money or otherwise your company will fail on the first day. It's all bullshit. It's really, it's all about doing your own thing. If you want, really want to do your own thing, like creating a product for time tracking, Creating a product for time tracking that was in a space where there's like bazillions of other products out there. But the problem with those other products is they're all not good. The people that did those products obviously don't care about their products or are just too dumb. I don't know. But <laughs> uh, maybe that was a bit too harsh. Uh, <laughs> but. Some of them actually care. Some of those products are not bad, but uh, Freckle is better I think, <laughs> because we really care about the user and um, that's, that's our thing. And uh, we can make money and a profit by caring about users and uh, everyone's happy with that, you know. The users win, we win. Perfect. Any plans to make this an annual conference? Uh, yeah, we're actually are planning a, a second edition of SchnitzelConf right now. We're not sure about which format, you know, if we do it annually or, or, or every half year or if we change cities or if we do like a, uh, some sort of mini conferences in between or online conferences. There's all sorts of possibilities, but we, we definitely want to uh, uh, have more of those bootstrapping conferences uh, because we think Bootstrapping is a really, really good option for a lot of people, especially in the web business with info products and uh, web applications as software as a service, because you do not need much money to get started. We started with a budget of maybe like $1,000. took us two months to implement the first version, and we, uh, we made money from the beginning. So that's totally possible to do. Same for info products, it's even easier. If you write a PDF about some topic you really know well, uh, perfect. People will, will, will pry it from your like, hands, you know, they will pay your money for that because they want to know. Uh, right now, if you, if you would write a PDF about Node.js or a PDF about Zepto or a PDF about uh, Wim, for example, there's no good cheat sheets about Wim. 
write a good cheat sheet about Vim. People will love it and people will pay your money for it. It's, it's really not that hard to get started. And this is the thing we want to get across at the conferences. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And uh, I hope we get many, many more uh, podcasts from you guys because you guys are also doing a pretty awesome job. Thank you for that. Thanks. Appreciate it.